test, test, te testing, testing. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I hope you are in the right class. Uh, this class is uh, FINA uh, 6282, um, so it's a second semester, uh, second trimester, sorry. So uh, I guess uh, probably I sh you guys know pretty very well about your, among your classmates, but probably you don't know me too much because uh, probably I didn't join the uh, welcoming dinner in the beginning of semester because I was out of Hong Kong at that time. Um, so probably just uh, some introduction of myself. Um, oh, sorry for that. Um, so uh, I was a graduate from uh, CHK, B school, uh, as an IFFA student. Uh, I studied finance and uh, actual science when I was undergrad. And after that, I uh, do my uh, master of philosophy in econ in uh, econ department, not in business school, but got econ department because uh, I want to do economics. And then after that, I go to the States, uh, go to US at uh, Boston College, uh, do my uh, uh, master PhD. So I got it uh, like uh, 10, uh, 11, 11 years ago. And then I was teaching in Singapore, uh, National University of Singapore, uh, there for eight years. And then I come back uh, to teach in uh, B school here. So I also have a, a courtesy appointment in the econ department. So pretty much I'm more like the econ person, but I also do uh, research in finance. So that is uh, pretty much my background. Oh, so basically just trying to convince you, uh, I'm eligible to teach the class, All right? So, uh, so uh, probably you asked what I have been teaching so far. So in Singapore, I taught uh, uh, the, uh, they, all, they call the honor class, the, the microeconomics. So honor class in Singapore, uh, basically equal to ma master level. So basically master level. And then I do the uh, uh, two applied finance class, one in the honors level, the other is the master level as well. And also, uh, I also taught the PhD uh, industrial organization class. And uh, when uh, I went back to Hong Kong like three years ago. So what I do is I do the uh, undergraduate stat class. And then I also do the uh, master class for statistics. And the other one I do is the PhD level in econ theory. So basically I'm doing uh, either statistics, uh, economics, and also finance. So uh, that is related to my teaching. And uh, some of you would my care if I do research, what kind of research I'm doing. Uh, mainly I do uh, microeconomic theory uh, and I do game theory as uh, one of my fields. So I apply game theory in various fields. And also I uh, work on uh, financial economics. So uh, these are the fields that I was doing. So you can see uh, it pretty much fit what this class is about, right? This class is about econ in finance practice. So basically I do econ, I also do finance. So basically I think uh, uh, that might justify some of your uh, tuition pay for this class. So who are helping us beside me? And also I think uh, our tutor is sitting at the back uh, having the, uh, yeah. Maybe you want to say something? Do you want to say something? Um, so a TA, I haven't met him yet. I, I'm probably he's not around, I guess, right? So, but uh, probably somehow you will interact with him. But mainly you talk to Kelvin uh, most of the time. But uh, sometimes uh, he may be helping uh, to uh, do some grading or some other assistance as well. Um, so probably ask what this class is about. So it's a core class required for everyone. So it's a uh, uh, we will do uh, 
little bit ambitious because it's uh, the core syllabus, you will see the objective is like do the micro and macro. So, uh, so we try to do it uh, in the three, three parts. The first part, we will do a foundation. Uh, probably today we'll cover uh, the first type. Our first topic is the market and financial market. Uh, basically, it's just like more, more or less a review of uh, economic principle class that you have learned, but probably you may or may not, but uh, probably you forgot, but we'll focus on the uh, review aspect. So probably you would find it too easy, but I, I would try to uh, see if it is too easy or too difficult, we'll uh, try to uh, change the difficulty level. Although I put up all the slide there, uh, but uh, probably I, I would change according to uh, how uh, the class is progressing. And the next class is uh, more like the advanced micro theory version. So we give you the foundation of the market. So to give you how we arrive at uh, uh, the demand and supply diagram. So more or less uh, a master level class. So somewhat PhD, but slightly a stream level and master class. And after that, we'll talk about uncertainty interval choice, right? So basically this is what the finance is about, right? It's uncertainty and also the trade-off between present and future, right? So uh, that would be the thing. And after that, we'll talk about game theory. And uh, possibly this is less mentioned in classical finance class, but uh, game theory is the way that uh, how you model uh, interaction among agents, and that is what happened in uh, stock market, or the financial market, or the m and bidding war, all those kind of stuff, and uh, that's why game theory is all the foundation that we need. And after that, uh, we will focus on microeconomics uh, uh, for three topics. Uh, we will dip a uh, little bit down to the uh, more asymmetric information, uh, look at how uh, contract theory uh, work in practice and give you some explanation of what we observe in the uh, finance practice. And of that, we look at uh, a public good uh, externality, right? Look at recently we have a ESG and CSR, uh, environmental concern, the green stuff. And then after that, we talk about information technology and network effect, right? Uh, hot topic involves some uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, those kind of model, if you try to see the handouts. And after that, the last two classes, we will talk about uh, standard uh, macro class, uh, we are talking about growth and also about business cycles. Uh, this will be, uh, we we'll try to finish uh, one topic for each, so you'll be nine classes. And the remaining two classes that we will work on will be uh, the project. Some of you actually uh, form the group or some of you have not, but uh, I would, uh, we will need you to form the group at the end of the uh, actual period. So let me uh, talk about your grade. Uh, so usually we will uh, following more or less, I do is following what happened in last year, so we'll be participating five percent. So uh, part of it will be the attendance that uh, which Kelvin will send out to uh, check it out and then see, and then also how you uh, participate in the class, right? Because I think this is more like uh, a uh, part-time course, right? So I guess uh, it's better not for me to talk a lot because uh, maybe we're tiring, right? Because after five days of work, and probably the Saturday you come to school, then probably you want to. Uh, have some uh, more, little bit relaxed, so uh, I will en encourage some participation. And uh, the quiz will be 20%. Um, so it's an open book, basically just MC, MCQ questions. Just our four choices, not five or four. And I uh, just choose quest choose do it. Uh, and the classics will be uh, basically asking the topic one. And the other one, uh, class 10 will be the topic two. And the, uh, there'll be final exam, a uh, closed book, uh, will be everything. Uh, so I decided to do a closed book because uh, I guess it would be easier to, uh, for you to do the closed book with cheat sheet rather than open book. With open book, then you will be uh, more difficult. I used to do open book for other classes, but I, I guess this closed book is easier for the part-time student uh, because I can, I, I can ask easier questions, right? So, but in case you want to a challenge, let me know that we can do open book. But uh, I, I, I try to do closed book, but uh, let me know, but uh, cheat sheet, I mean, maybe you can allow more, but, uh, but maybe two or three, but uh, let, let's see what, is it sufficient? Um, and the projects, and uh, I guess uh, this is the uh, part that we apply our uh, knowledge into practice. So basically, probably you see the five cases in the blackboard. Uh, so we will do uh, at the end of two classes, uh, so as to uh, try to, uh, see if how well you apply the things. So uh, as emphasized, uh, this class is more applied nature. 
So we try to keep the math minimum, but uh, more than econ is basically all of the math. So we really can't uh, skip the math. So I, I saw some of you actually taking the picture. So probably I should put, uh, I should also put that, uh, I will put that visible to you. So maybe you can, you can also see it in the, uh, in the blackboard because I thought that would be something that uh, not needed. Uh, but that would be the, that would be the uh, case. And the last class we will do the uh, final exams. Uh, so uh, I think the, uh, this room is too small and uh, our tutor will book another room. Uh, make sure that each one of you will be separated by one seat. Uh, but uh, that's pretty much uh, I want to say. So in case uh, I know every one of you is very busy, uh, some of you might not attend due to some rare reasons. If you happen to have very urgent reason, you can contact our TA then. With approval, you can attend by Zoom. Uh, usually I will record the class by Zoom in case you want to review, I will send out the link. So that in case you want to uh, do some review that I, I, is also possible. But I guess uh, our class is not very technical. So uh, I think you, you just read the slides and should not be uh, too difficult. Um, and the recharge group, I guess uh, most of you would know this. Uh, and if you uh, happen to have not yet, then please join. But uh, uh, otherwise, that would be fine. Um, any question before we proceed? But I just, uh, all this slide basically just uh, a uh, stream the version of this uh, course outline. I guess I don't want to go line by line because it's, uh, the time is better used for teaching or interaction rather than just uh, going over all the, all the thing. Um, oh, but probably I want to mention a little bit about the book. Uh, probably some of you asked whether you need to read the book or not. Uh, in general, I guess uh, you don't have to read the book unless you confuse of some of the concepts. So of course, the easiest thing is uh, to look at the book yourself, or now because AI is so easy to look around. But if you're confused, then you can talk to our TA and talk to me and email us and try to see if we can help you. Uh, but in case you are interested in uh, knowing more, then probably you want to uh, uh, look at the first three books. This is basically uh, written for managers. Uh, especially the second and the third book probably are, uh, even though you are out of the school for many, many years, then these two books still is readable. Uh, the first book is slightly more technical if you haven't uh, studied for a while. And the advanced textbook is a little bit uh, uh, slightly more advanced. So um, probably you only need to consult it when you confuse with what we do in the class or you want a little bit challenge. And of course, uh, I also include some technical ramifications for those who are really uh, good at the math, already uh, uh, good, then you can take a challenge for those. And these are the cases that we will do uh, for the uh, last three classes, right? So two classes uh, there, and that would be the thing. Uh, it's already in the black box, so you can take a look. Uh, just to remind you that these courses are copyrighted, protected, so please don't dispute uh, outside the class. Um, yeah, I think I already said about that. Uh, so about the group project, so uh, I guess some of you already sent it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you form a group of five, okay? So, uh, and uh, I don't think I need to uh, go anything deeper, but uh, if in case you can just uh, try to look. Uh, if you need more reference, let me know. I'll try to figure that out. But I guess uh, I'm not going to lie by lie. In case you want, you can just uh, ask. Is there a question before I start? Because this is just overview or? No? No? Um, in that case, uh, if not, then probably we can do some uh, very small ice breaking exercise. Uh, would be this one. So we just spend a few minutes to work on this one. So, uh, because I want to know how good about the math, how the background before I proceed. So, uh, is, it, is it there? Is it okay? Let me check. I'll never try.
Yeah. I think we spend a few minutes on that one. So I guess we can uh, start talking a little bit. Uh, so let's see how you feel about the first class. Um, so seems like the most, most of you feel OK. Uh, some of you feel terrible. <laughs> uh, that's way often, uh, right? We sort of stock the market, right? It's, uh, Monday, they say, well, we can effect. Monday tend to be the stock price is lower than the other case. Uh, probably it's like the case, right? Because you start to work. I mean, the semester is start, and then you have to suffer from uh, this class. More or less, you feel terrible. And some of you pretty the optimistic. And see this uh, feeling actually would change how you view the economy. Okay? That's why I asked this question first, because that actually would predict uh, how you are optimistic or not. <laughs> OK. So as you can see, I asked on Saturday, right? You supposed to have holiday, but you have to study. So probably you are not, you are not very happy. So explainably that you are become pessimistic. But it is pretty surprising that uh, many of you are pessimistic about the Hong Kong stock market, given that the Hong Kong stock index is already like drop from uh, 30,000 to now like uh, 60,000. So uh, how pessimistic we go? Is it going to uh, way bad? I don't know, I mean, but, uh, but that actually uh, turns out that uh, maybe you are right, I don't know, but maybe I'm too uh, pessimistic, but uh, or I don't know. Um, housing market, okay? Which is a little surprising because uh, you see uh, should be more or less correlated, right? And you can see from our elite classmates, right? Uh, we have more people optimistic compared to the stock, uh, which is somewhat puzzling to me, uh, because many of you would agree that uh, the stock price is a leading indicator for the housing market, right? Which means that you start stock price goes down, and then housing price would follow, right? This is what we, we would do something there in the macro, but because of uh, liquidity reason or whatever reason that the, uh, because house is a little bit illiquid, right? So usually you would expect the houses would follow what the trend would be. And uh, I would expect the other way wrong, where right? people would be more optimistic about the stock, but uh, apparently I'm wrong, but, uh, but that would be interesting. Uh, but probably you may feel differently if I ask you on Monday or during the weekday. 
but that actually tried to show you there's something here. Uh, the sentiment is a little bit different. And um, okay, so it means that uh, no one believed that they were good, and uh, many of you feel that uh, we're poorly. Uh, so I will try to be slow a little bit. Slow down. I mean, not not to be running too fast. The median is two point two. So, uh, uh, yeah, okay. I will try to uh, manage my pace to the way that. Uh, okay. So today we'll review those kind of stuff. Uh, so, what about what about five? <laughs> okay. Some of you comfortable, and most are not comfortable. Okay, so uh, I so usually I would do in this way uh, as a master class. Usually I would do is uh, we teach in the way uh, try to be as formal as rigorous as possible, and but when it comes to assessment, uh, I will try to uh, not mainly focus on theory part, not really on uh, math, but some calculation will be needed. But otherwise, we are in master of finance, right? Not Master of Arts or Social Science, right? So we need some, <laughs> some calculation. Some calculator activity will be needed for your uh, quiz or uh, uh, exam, but um, will, not, will not require you uh, deep math, okay? I'll try to explain as much as we can. Um, so I guess you want me to uh, balance the theory and practical, so I try to do as much as possible. Uh, so in the in the slide, I would try to put as formal thing as I do. Then when I talk, I try to give you uh, more uh, practical application and uh, some of these. So hopefully that would be uh, practical. Okay. And the very last one, not bad grade, uh, should be fine, I guess, right? Uh, I will, as, as far as I understand, right, the median, right, is like B plus or above, so that really depends on how well the other way you do. Um, yeah, I hope. So. So, uh, fun learning, that's fine. Uh, tutorial question. They have to ask Kelvin uh, to make sure that your tutorial will give you a uh, good prediction of what you observe in the quiz or final, but uh, should we try to do that? Um, so we, okay, I try to do that, uh, have fun. Uh, I guess if you attend the class and pay attention, is Difficult not to pass, but uh, you can try to do that. But uh, but uh, it's not easy. You try you try to fail. It's not that easy. I mean, they can try. If you attend class and do the thing, it's very difficult to fail. But uh, uh, okay, I try to be easier. Yeah, I think that is the normal, right? Want to be fun and then uh, try to learn something. That's okay, that's okay. You can see our first class line is not, not too much math. Okay, that's very little math, okay, so it shouldn't be, should be fine. But, uh, oh, how to decide which group present and with 10 or 11? So, uh, I guess, Kelvin, will you explain that? Uh, to decide who group present? So which group to present, so because,
Also, So the question is already there, okay? Basically five questions for each one, um, and the cases are all there, okay? So this is a blackboard, in case you don't know, but uh, that will be the case there. Okay, pass. Uh, I guess given the way I design the system, right? You have the quiz, which is multiple choice, and your project. Uh, so basically, passing would be should be okay if you if you just do that. I mean, you also attend the exam, then shouldn't be a pass would be a doable job, right? But whether the grade range should have to depend on your performance. But passing, if you attend everything there, should not be an issue, right? Because it's the way I designed the designed the structure. And also how I designed the exam, right? There should be some question that you should be able to get if you attend the class. Okay. So um, that would be pretty much. Is there any question? Let me see. Uh, seems to be okay for this one. I, I guess uh, if no question, then I would just try to uh, some interesting story. Uh, try to have some interesting story. Um, if no question, then we start right away. Okay, so we cover topic one today. So uh, I'll probably just weigh one minor thing is, uh, uh, next week we'll have a double class because I think the week after is uh, winter sourceless and also the uh, Christmas, right? So if I do the class then probably where people will join, and also the week after also is New Year. So I follow the tradition of what happened last year. I just skip that two classes and concentrate on two. Hopefully that is okay, because uh, if no one is here, then it's very boring for me to come to talk, right? So that would be uh, more fun. Uh, so let me uh, go to this one. So uh, probably you should let me know if I go too fast or too slow, because uh, in a part-time program, because people come from very diverse background, so uh, maybe sometimes people feel I'm too fast or too slow, then let me know. I will try to adjust accordingly. Uh, we did not cover everything in the slide, okay? So if I don't cover, then, uh, then uh, I will not test on those things, okay, if I skip those. Uh, but if too easy, I still skip, then it's, it's also count as included, okay? So introduction. So uh, welcome to the first class. So since uh, many of you are not confident about principle of econ, so that's what we do. We just review the basics of econs and try to make sure that everyone would be on the same page. Uh, although some of you would think the basic of econ is too basic, but how to apply it and how to actually use it is uh, very useful. And indeed that uh, happened, I mean, uh, for many of you actually work, we, when we need economics, and that is uh, the basic thing we talk. Um, so we will focus on market, and in particular later we we'll talk about financial market, and then we we'll look at who are the participants, who are the participants, and who, what the equilibrium and the market efficiency in this class. So what are the important topics? Um, so the, this is our learning objectives. So uh, economics, if you look at the basic textbook. Right, they always start with what we call scarcity. Right, there's a resources constraint. You can't satisfy all you want, and you have to pick and choose. Right, the idea of opportunity cost, and come from this, build up the whole economics story. Right, and then the problem is because of uh, we have so many people in this world, 
right? And everyone want more? The problem is how to allocate limited resources. And in economics, uh, you can look at the introductory textbook, they look at the market, right? The market is allocate resources full price, even though the price and allocate, right? That's what happened in the uh, financial market in general, the stock market, right? But you know that in the world, there's things more than market, right? For example, auction or IPO, well, M&A, right? These are not, there's no market price, right? And these are more advanced topic. We'll touch some of those, right? But not every single thing, but uh, we'll try to do those, okay? But in this class, we'll focus on market because market uh, is a study uh, in economics uh, for like many, many years. But recently, the economics focus on a lot of non-market problems, okay? And uh, probably everyone we know, I, I guess, is market, right? Is uh, studied by, first study systematically by what we call Adam Smith, the guy, right? Who's the father of economics. And the metaphor for market is uh, invisible hand, right? This tells us uh, there is some invisible hand that guide the market there. And we'll talk about uh, how the market allocate resources. Okay, is how efficient is they are or how, when they would work, when they would not. And we look at uh, what the market gives us is who, the market is the consumer and firms and usually give you the standard thing with demand and supply. Okay, in this class, we don't go into details of how consumer form of demand and supply take a given, but we'll go deeper in the next class, how the consumer behavior get with demand curve how firms behavior get to the supply curve and they're the foundation we don't give you now and you may ask why we need to look at the foundation is because we need to know when things changes how they behave differently okay and uh, this gives us how to model them how to understand them and uh, economics as many of you would know from undergraduate right usually this uh, divided into two parts micro and macro and that's what we do in the, uh, how we who divide in the, this class. And of course, uh, in the modern macro or modern research, there's no distinction. All micro or macro, all macro or micro. The reason what I said is everything is micro founded. Look at how individual. We don't assume how the economy works, but we will look at how individual behave and some of that become the total economy. And uh, that's what the modern macro is doing, but uh, the macro we cover in this class still the classical version, which we don't go to the foundation. Uh, probably you ask why we do that, why I don't teach you the uh, state of the art. Uh, two reasons. One, uh, the math is too difficult. Uh, second is in terms of uh, prediction, uh, there are not too much difference. Uh, in terms of uh, their behavior. So look at the central banker, uh, they all, the difference is very little. So uh, of course, uh, uh, to keep the math minimum, uh, I will do the uh, macro model. Uh, that is not the classical ISLM, but we teach you the new, new version, uh, uh, but we'll talk about that at the very end. Okay? But the main concept is demand supply and price and market equilibrium. And Uh, some question? Okay. Uh, don't worry, it's very simple. So it's not going to be torture you. So it's very simple. Okay. So that would be the thing. Um, for finance, right? Since you are doing master finance, probably you ask uh, how we come with the finance, right? And probably you would know the finance as special as a field of econ. So everything learned from econ actually can directly apply to finance. And I would try to highlight the connection between them, but do know that there's no difference between econ and finance from application or from research perspective, okay? And the financial market is same as market. It's just allocation of financial resources, okay? And of course, same as the market, it more trade-off, right? The trade-off you learn very well is in finance, the two trade-off, the main trade-off is risk and return, right? And also the other one is present and future, Right, is the substitution, the interest rate, and those kind of stuff. Uh, and we will talk about the efficiency of the financial market, right? And uh, that we will look at uh, the one very famous hypothesis is called EMH, 
the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, we will talk about those. And then uh, we look at who are in the market and what are the fields, and uh, these are the uh, key concepts, right? How you discount uh, future, how you people trade off recent return, and the market efficiency imply no arbitrage, which means that if you have two assets, they generate the same payoff, they should give the same price, right? Or uh, well, a similar price, right? Just look at the case where A share and X share, right? You should expect the premiums to be minimal as far as we're concerned. There's some, something different, but uh, you should expect they're similar, right? So uh, these are the uh, concepts and ideas that uh, we look at one by one today, okay? Or if there are no particular question, we just go ahead. Okay, any questions? Okay. Because I, I somehow assume you have some background, so uh, I don't go to very basic. So in case uh, I use a terminology that is, uh, you don't feel comfortable, let me know. So economics, I said, uh, is a way to study uh, how to allocate limited resources. And uh, in the next class, we will directly model how people behave and in, in place of scarcity. And scarcity is the, the very basics of uh, 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 economics, right? If there's an allocation problem. And uh, the classical idea is opportunity cost, right? Probably everyone would know, right? If we, even though there's no money, in the opportunity cost there, right? Since saying you are staying here, right? Listening to me, blah, 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 blah. Right? You forgo the opportunity to, uh, go to somewhere else, to drink a beer or whatever, right? So we just uh, give up the stuff, right? And uh, the way that we talk about today is look at the market mechanism, okay? Look at a complete formation setting where everyone can observe the price and react according to it. And people don't have market power in the sense that look at the price and act accordingly, okay? Everyone is small. And that will tell us the standard classical picture that will be in our mind is called the uh, Marcellian cross, where the demand and supply uh, thing, so that would be, uh, we'll talk about. Okay, that's what you can't. If you forget principle, there's a principle class. All right, we'll go deeper, but this is what we'll talk about today. And you can't, there'll be two fields. As I said, there's micro and macro. And uh, micro is the one that we'll talk about in the first four classes. Uh, sorry, it should be first uh, seven classes. And the macro will be two last classes. Uh, you will see uh, they are closely related, okay? And I'm um, not going to go in deeper. So, uh, but uh, what are the advanced uh, microeconomic theory we're looking at? Uh, look at game theory. We have one class of game theory. And, uh, and also uh, some industrial organization, how firms compete, right? And then probably ask why we need to care about that, right? First, as I said, uh, look at the stock market, right? And then you look at uh, investor uh, actually trading with each other, right? And that is the game theory. Or how the firms, you when you do industry analysis, right? That you will need to look at how firms compete when you come with new product and how the market share and the price and profit, and that will be industrial organization. And uh, next you may uh, talk about contract theory. It's also application of the game theory. Uh, you have a case where uh, information asymmetry and uh, to explain a lot of financial uh, products, why you have insurance, why insurance have uh, product differentiation, right, is to avoid adverse selection. I mean, there are many, many uh, ideas that behind contract theory. Uh, and it's also uh, uh, an advanced topic that uh, you see the rec uh, recent 10 years, I think that the Fee Nobel Prize award in that area in the contract theory. Uh, and next, Republic Economics. Right, and how we have been talking about market is good, right? But market often fails in certain scenario, and that we need someone to take in and do stuff, right? And that will be what the public economics is doing. And the government regulations, or what we look at recently, we have the uh, corporate social responsibility CSR, or ESG and fundamental social, uh, those kind of concepts are actually related from that. And uh, uh, we don't have time for this class, but uh, it's also interesting to look at the trade and also behavioral econ or behavioral finance. But uh, if you have time, we'll cover those, but uh, uh, that would not be uh, the main concern for us today. 
So uh, probably when we define finance, right? Finance is a subfield of econ that focuses on financial market and financial resources. Okay. And uh, I think all of you already know it. I'm not going to go line by line, but I want to highlight that uh, in the modern uh, finance research, usually we in, in, uh, separate them into two parts, what is called asset pricing and uh, corporate finance. Uh, there's also smaller fields as well, but these are two big main fields. And uh, probably some of you will do uh, in the more advanced class, elective, but asset pricing is to look at uh, how asset price has been determined. Okay? And many of you probably know CAPM model uh, or other, other pricing model. And next, next class, we will talk about how we derive those CAPM from uh, consumer behavior. How consumer trade off the future and uh, today, and uncertainty would give us the beta pricing equation that we will do next next one. But uh, of course, uh, uh, more detail you will cover in more elective class, or we just uh, give you the some feeling of uh, why how you can't give you those ideas, right? Because uh, in the undergraduate finance class or investment class, we talk about mean variance optimization and why does it work, right? When does it work, what doesn't, doesn't work, right? We'll give you more foundation. And uh, that's a uh, modern research doing, right? How to link finance to macro, they call macro finance or micro finance even these days. So uh, that would be, uh, uh, that uh, would be the case. And uh, the other corporate finance, right? Looking at the, how the firm would uh, set up the balance sheet, right? Whether the debt or equity or how the firm structure. Uh, this is related to the concept theory I said, uh, because uh, the problem of the modern corporation is separation of management ownership, right? The manager is not going to maximize the interest of owner unless you design the incentive correctly, right? So you have to uh, have able to constant monitoring through some incentive, right? So that would be uh, this is about. Uh, we'll touch on some, but we will not uh, able to into very deep because of the concern of time, but we will have some one, or one class to talk about this, right? And uh, what are the method in econ and finance? Actually, you can see that not much different. In econ, you will talk about theory and empirical, and for finance, the same. Uh, but finance, you will see more uh, simulation and uh, more quantitative. Uh, but uh, that you can see, uh, that's why uh, you have to learn econ because they are the foundational classes for you. Okay? And probably this is a slide that uh, you would care because this is the thing you learn from this class, right? Why we need econ, right? Economics is trying to give you how to understand how people behave over time. Choice, we call it the temporal choice, right? We choose how much I consume now, how much I save now, versus in the future, and how we make this under uncertainty. Uh, that will be topic of topic three, right? Then give us the idea of uh, expected utility or how we do investment. And uh, is this measure information, right? As we see uh, uh, later, uh, uh, why we observe bid ask spread in the uh, exchange rate market is because of uh, a very selection problem. Okay, later you will see. But uh, and uh, and the other important thing is uh, from economics, you would understand how the market works and how equilibrium being characterized and how you can understand uh, the market forces and you to explain and predict. And understand how macro change people's behavior, how markets are related to each other, how one thing changes in one market translates to the other market, and how people interact, right? And uh, that's very important because uh, uh, quite surprisingly, many smart people, if you are not trained in game theory, would make a lot of mistakes in thinking, uh, not strategically, right? Probably uh, one of the easiest examples you can relate is law and economics, is uh, when someone commit a crime that is crazy, but we don't call for very harsh punishment, right? And for example, you say, some crazy man tried to rape a woman or some other hurt, hurt a guy, hurt some people, 
why we don't send that guy to capital punishment, right? One of the reasons is uh, if you do a heavy punishment for minor crime, right? And that means that the cost, the marginal cost of doing a heavier crime is become zero. So you got crazy, right? The society have to be, the punishment should be proportional to the crime. Otherwise, I mean, people will respond, right? So that, that, that means that uh, you have to think when you design certain stuff or make a law or make a contract or uh, how government intervene, that have to be careful, right? The, one of the most uh, interesting thing that probably in economics is about rent control, right? And probably many of you know in uh, US, in New York, right? The famous rent control that make the rent cannot go up, right? Or look at uh, other cases, look at uh, uh, Stockholm, Sweden, right? They also have a serious rent control. So what happened if you have rent control? Of course, the rent is not going up, right? But the problem is the owner is not going to maintain the house, make it very bad. No one is going to build a new house, right? And that means that, I mean, you try to hurt those people, you want to help, okay? So have uh, what we call unintended consequence. And also you have to look at interaction and right? people are not stupid, right? So you have to think one step ahead, right? So that would be the game field tells you. And as I said, the design a contract, right? So uh, that would be the things that probably would be useful. Uh, I think this slide would be the thing that why we want to study economics, right? How we think change our, our finance idea. Okay, send a question. Is there any question? If not, I think now is at the sub 15. So we will, as usual, have 15 minutes break and we'll come back at uh, 3.30. Uh, Oh yes. I have like derivatives, like because I took econ before, so they have like a lot of math. Oh, you can see my slides. No, not no, no. We we don't uh we don't explicitly really ask for that. We will use some derivative to explain the concept, but we are not using the derivative. Oh, we will do it next class. But we are not expecting to solve the problem, but we will try to give you the framework. So if we have like derivatives, like what? I just like already tell you that what, what we needed. But we are not asking you to, to, to take a derivative. here. So I also took like game, uh, game theory. So I think, is it going to be the same like how to grab the, the path? Like how do we well, we will basically try to apply it to uh, show you some of the, what, what conclusion we can get and how to apply in finance. Okay, so like we read the questions and then we grab the path, we have what decisions. Oh, yeah, that's that, that we mean better induction, I guess. Yeah, that is something. Yeah, that's something better induction and solve some game. So don't worry, you are not, we are not asking, uh, we are not asking something that uh, super complicated. So it's more like applied, so don't worry. It's applied.
Um, hi. Uh, so it's good that uh, come back. So the first one half is the introduction, and the uh, second one third will be talking about econ, and the last one third will be finance. So because uh, today we will review and econ finance. So um, so let me make the full screen. So um, as we said, these are the topic that we we're looking at, right? Look at how uh, scarcity, right? Requires to have a problem of allocating resources and market is the way to allocate resources through the price and why equilibrium would be there because uh, there would be force of demand and supply and later we'll see. And for those who have learned econ, then we will see the famous diagram of Marcellian course and uh, we will talk about how the market allocate and why is it good, okay? And of course, everything would translate it to finance. And, uh, and later we'll talk about the other thing is cost specialization and resharing problem. Uh, but let's go, uh, that would be there. So market system is uh, the way of allocation through demand supply. And uh, this is known as field price. If you follow what is Chicago School of Economics and they think that the price, so-called the invisible hand, or is to things to regulate, right? So as long as you can imagine, you can imagine if the price is transparent, right? People look at the price, and they can coordinate implicitly through the price. The market price is how people coordinate, right? Because uh, that is the reason they compare the market system market other system. Look at the system where there's a planner who decides everything, right? If he is able to know every single aspect of the economy, usually the planner can do best, better than everything. But the main problem is uh, to know the information of every people is very difficult, it's very costly. So market would be the, one of the way that to allocate the outcome, okay? Uh, in the ideal case, this is as good as the planner. We will try to see. Okay. And the other thing is when we have markets efficient, it allow people to exchange, right? Market ex exchange resources. So that means that people can specialize on uh, what we do the best, right? So we don't need to grow the food, we don't need to uh, create the product, right? We can just do finance, right? use other people's money to invest and make money, right? And stay there, don't, don't need to do other things, right? So that is uh, specialization. So we will talk about those, okay? And let's get started, okay? And always you will see when you start the market, we start with the first thing, downward sloping demand, right? So it's saying that uh, it's like this graph, right? This is the, the demand curve, right? Essentially, it means that if uh, it gives you the idea that the horizontal axis is the people, how much they want, given the price, right? If this is a price, and this is how much people want to buy, right? Basically, it's just telling us what? How much people need to pay for a product at a certain price. And probably you ask, why is downward sloping, right? Uh, we will talk about this more formally in the next topic. But uh, roughly speaking, the, the downward sloping demand curve is basically telling us for each point, telling how much people want to buy is a marginal consumer. It's the guy that just at that price want to buy, right? So if you get price and lower and lower, actually more people want to buy it, right? In general, this is the case, right? Usually the price is lower, you want to buy more in general, right? But it did not be the case, right? Uh, look at these days, right? We talk about the uh, downgrading of consumption, right? That what it means is, right, people buy lang song fan, lang song fan, so two dish, uh, two dish vegetable, two dish rice, 
right? And and uh, and why we we see that happen, right? Because people income get lower. And when you get lower, then you want those cheaper product, right? So for this, for demand curve to hold is, you have to hold other things constant, right? If um, things are not constant, then things will be very difficult. So we will talk about this in the next class. But simply said, in general, if things is cheaper, then you want to buy more, right? But probably some of you may not agree if you are in the Guangdong row, Guangdong Dou, Guangdong Row, right? And and what happened there, right? Look at the stop there, right? Probably you know, right? That stop, that that street is the most expensive, most expensive in the world, right? Even more than the uh, the Fifth Avenue in the New York, right? And why, right? Because that place is selling what we call luxury product, right? What's luxury product? The higher the price, you want to buy more, right? Look at the expensive handbag, right? If just selling ten thousand dollar, no one will buy it, right? Hundred thousand dollar, maybe see some people buy, buy one million more people buying it, right? The value of it increase, right? Even the same product, right? So, right, that's that is how sometimes things would happen, right? So, in general, it's true, but in some cases not, right? But in our first class, we focus on the general case where price go up actually would one less price go down with more. There will be some other cases, right? So uh, later we will see, but that is the idea, right? So it's down sloping, right? And in the, in the case linear, that would be very simple, right? You, you would just, uh, uh, would it just be that, right? Sorry, it would just be linear, linear, right? But in general, it's not linear. It can be any shape, right? And for those who, no, this is the uh, ideal world, right? We know the downward slope thing, but actually how, in practice, how people do it, right? And actually, usually the firm would only know one point, right? You set the price, this is how much they charge and what the consumer there, right? And how do firm know? That is a million dollar question. And actually that's why you see a lot of the firm try to do price cut, do sales, do promotion, to actually get this line, get the slope of that, right? To get the slope of that, then he can try to uh, find a point that maximize the profit, right? So that is a very important thing. I mean, a lot of people make money uh, by just doing the market research to figure out this thing, right? Do the data analysis, but it's not my class is working, but a lot of people in Amazon or the platform, they actually, a lot of people doing that, right? So that's why you see the platform, the price keep changing or the uh, look at the park and shop or welcome, right? The price keep changing over days, right? So that, that they want to uh, get this one, right? Or look at uh, Tesla, right? The price of the car, they, they adjust every uh, first day, right? Because of, they want to get this line to maximize. That's how you get that, but uh, we assume, right? Everything we know here, right? And the consumer give you the demand curve, which we will give you the foundation next class. And the other is the other side of the market, the firm, okay? The firm actually gives you a supply curve, okay? And probably the most often you would see the supply curve is look like this in undergraduate class, right? It's like this, right? It's upper sloping, right? It's like uh, the more product you sell, right? Okay, you, you have a higher price. Right? Or, or the other way around, usually we talk about the higher the market price, the more uh, quantity is in the market. Okay? And what does it capturing? Remember, this is the market, market supply. So which means that uh, the higher the price you go, right, the more people would come in and produce. Right? That's why, uh, because different firms have different cost structure, right? If the price is going up, the originally high cost producer can come in and join. What is the example there? The example there is the oil industry in the US, where right? they sell oil. When right? the oil price is low, those producers uh, in the US will not produce the oil from the seaside, right? they sell oil. But once the market price goes up, people find it 
profitable to produce oil, so they come in, right? So the higher the price, that actually would make a lot of people come in, right, and do the production, right? So basically, the supply curve, as later you will see in the next class, we will say this coming from the cost of production, okay? Basically, the cost structure determine the supply curve, okay? And people's preference determine the demand curve, okay? So basically, just how we explain uh, in the next class, right? The cost structure, and uh, and probably you would think, uh, well, have you have to be upper slope pain? The answer is no. Different from demand curve, demand curve is always down slope, down slope pain. Supply curve need not be upper slope pain. Okay? Remember why upper slope pain? I said is the marginal cost goes up, right? But in some industries, not like this, right? For example, you consider the case where the platform, right, or DD, right, or the uh, uh, or the Uber, right, or Microsoft search engine, right, which we'll talk about this later in our course, is or uh, when they have the high fixed cost and very low marginal cost, right, need not be this case, right. Look at the case, uh, power company, right. It's very deep, expensive to have the set up the generator, right, and build the network. But once it build, the cost is very low, right? And then it need not be like this, okay? But in general, this is true, okay? And, and but it need not be in this way. So this is the part that uh, supply curve is something you have to be very careful, okay? Especially when you have uh, game theory, okay? Why is the case? Because what the supply curve tells us is, given the price, I know the quantity, right? But remember when you have small number of firm company in the market, there's are interacting, the same price can be due to multiple equilibrium. There can be many scenarios corresponding to the same price. So that exa exactly there's no supply curve. Or when you have monopoly, we'll talk about next class, then no supply curve at all. Okay? Supply curve doesn't exist. Okay? And only exists when the market is competitive, then you can see this. Or nearly competitive, this is a good way to model. Okay? So that's why we need to learn game theory. Because then game theory, we don't have supply curve anymore. Depending on how they compete. Right? It's not something, uh, uh, this thing would work very well. Okay? But in general, if we care about the market is competitive, this will work well. And we know demand supply. So the question is, uh, this market, do they have a stable state or what we call equilibrium, okay? Is there any case that uh, we call a outcome, oh, in this graph, right? Which is the price and quantity is where they would be there, okay? And economists uh, would define equilibrium in the price that equalize the both quantity. Right, and that is called the Marcellian cross, where the price in the math is just like the quantity, right? Such that the demand curve uh, intersect the supply curve, right? solving the equation, right? Uh, it would be like this. Okay, this is the graph, right? Where the intersect there, right? And this is the price where people, no people want more at that price, no firm will do more. Right, everyone is happy, right? Given what the price is, right? And this equilibrium, because the assumption behind in this model is equilibrium is everyone is small. They it's assumption called price taker, right? No one is able to move the market, okay? Uh, and that it works, right? So that means that this is the outcome. Okay. So, uh, is that a question? Uh, if you haven't learned principal class, that would be something uh, might be a little bit challenging, but uh, I guess uh, you might at least heard of that. That would be fine. Any question before uh, we proceed? No? So, now let me uh, quickly go to an example. As I promised, I don't do too much math, so I just very simple math here. So hopefully that would not be too bad. So this is a linear demand, it's like downslope pain, right? Six minus P, so the higher the P, the smaller the Q. 
right? Linear demand is SP, so basically just like the graph you saw here, right? Right? And in case you would worry, this is six, right? Right? This is right because because uh right because when Q is zero, P is six, right? In this example. But um you basically how you solve it, right? You find the price such that they equalize, right? How to look at this from the perspective of this graph, okay? What you do is look at the price that clear the market, what we call, right? So that means that I would try to look at my price. Let me have a line here. I used to, so look at any random price here, okay? This is the price, okay? And this is the price here. And look at this price. Is it the force of demand and force of the supply with the same? If not, there's not. Okay? So what you do is to check every single price such that they equalize and turn out to be in the middle. Okay? We are in, in this exercise, we are not asking how we get to equilibrium. We're just saying that to check when is equilibrium, it just satisfy the condition. Okay? We talk about adjustment later, but Equilibrium doesn't talk about adjustment. It talk about a particular price, a particular quantity. Is it going to the market is clear? Okay. No one want more. No one want to produce more. One more do one less. One produce less. Okay. Everything is in balance there. So turn out you can see right. Only is in the middle where the cross is there. So basically solving these two equations, right? If you try to do that, right? Just uh, you learn in the uh, high school the. Uh, coordinate geometry or solving system equation, just equal that, right? And you can solve it, right? You can add p on both sides, p is equal to three. But if you don't want to do the math, just keep trial and error. P is three, right? The quantity supply is three, right? Quantity demand is six minus three is three. So same demand supply. So you solve this is the outcome, okay? And look that in this model, it's linear. Right? So it's naturally you see only one equilibrium. There's no guarantee that uh, the only one. Right? If you some wiggling or there uh, can be more than one. But in general, one is okay. Uh, later you will see in some cases you will have more than one equilibrium. And uh, you would probably where equilibrium is can be de can be depend on how people think. That's called the bubble. We will talk about that uh, two weeks later. I mean, next week, talk about why bu bubble. Right? Bubble exists because people have different uh, belief on what equilibrium might, might be. But, uh, but here, we only have one equilibrium. Here. Okay. So is that clear how we solve the problem? Basically, the inter intersection is the equilibrium, and that's how we solve it. Okay. And by math, I think this kind of math I would require you to know how to do. Shouldn't be difficult. Uh, it's okay, right? This kind of level. So uh, now we have a market mechanism here, okay? And as we said, market actually uh, work through the price. We we'll talk about adjustment now, okay? Because so far we don't talk about how they coordinate. What's the invisible hand here, okay? And uh, we'll talk about why it works, why it fails. Okay. And as we hint at the beginning, that is a, the term invisible hand is invented by uh, Adam Smith, uh, who is the father of economics. And uh, in his book, a call, An Inquiry into the uh, Wealth of Nations, shortly knows uh, Wealth of Nations, you can pick it up, that book uh, uh, you can read, it's very fun uh, if you want to. Um, the reversal hand, uh, the interesting thing is the market actually tells you that uh, even though everyone is not benevolent, right, everyone just do based on his own interest, okay, not to help others, but at the end, even though they only care about themselves, actually make the society good. Okay? But uh, it's surprising we still say people are selfish, but even selfish, then still okay, right? Of course, of course, uh, there's some big quotation, right? If everyone kill each other, right, that's not going to get a good outcome, right? I mean, 
the competition or pursuit of interest must be within some kind of norm and thing so that uh, no one goes do crazy thing, right? But that actually what it means. Uh, as long as on the market, they interact, right? So it is the original quotes, right? It's not the benefit of a bachelor and brewer and a baker who expect our dinner, but they don't care about the interest, right? We address our vows not to the humanity, but to their self-love. We never talk to them our own necessity, but of their advantages, right? So basically, it means that uh, not because of uh, they care us, okay? And we do, uh, we do our job, right? Just like me, right? I'm teaching here. It's not I'm benevolent of giving a free lecture, right? I got paid, right? I'm here, right? Why are you here? The other people cannot because you pay to come to this course, right? So not everyone can join. So that um, there's something we care. And as we said, invisible hand, okay, is a way that the market regulate, okay? And now we talk about invisible hand tells you how the demand supply uh, work and adjust the price to achieve the equilibrium, okay? We'll give the idea how the equilibrium be achieved. Okay, before we just say, okay, market is equilibrium, but we don't tell you why it's there. That's important, right? Because there's the equilibrium, we may not be there. There's no point, right? So let, let's see how we adjust there. So um, the first thing is look at when price is uh, low, okay? It's not high enough. So the example like this, okay? The example is suppose this is the price, okay? The price is too low, okay? Compared to the equilibrium we propose. So what you will see in this diagram, if P is here, okay? People want this QDP, and seller only want to sell QSP, okay? And in this case, what will happen, right? What will happen is, oh, then more people want, right? And what happened is, although, People are price thicker, right? Some people would really want to pay more to get a good, right? Because limit the price, right? Some people will secretly say, go to the firm. Okay, can you sell me this? I want to pay more than P, right? And that means that P would secretly slowly move up, right? That's how it works, right? It's order price thicker, right? But because of limit the supply, there's some way to allocate it, right? To adjust upward, right? And probably to explain why one thing is like this. So this is very nice, but what happened is, we didn't talk about that is, when we supply like this, when we demand like this, Okay, and so what is this? Is if supply is fixed? It's like say, like the uh, you go to uh, some concert, or uh, later when Macy come to Hong Kong and do football, right? They leave a number of seat there, right? And well, what you will see the price is kind of like fixed, right? The government said the price is fixed there. What happened is there will be excess demand, right? And there will be black market, right? So on and so forth, right? When the price is fixed by the government, like the rent control, there will be some way to allocate, not the price, right? Non-price mechanism there, right? So that will be somewhat related to this idea, right? And someone want to pay more than the price speed up, right? Until it's go there. So that's how that adjustment goes on. Okay? So that's why when we said beginning, why rent control is a problem, right? Because usually the rent control, if being useful, must be below the equilibrium price, right? And in that case, the price cannot go up, cannot adjust. There will be something to happen, right? You have to solve the problem. Is that okay? And Similarly, okay, um, we will see the same thing if the price is too high, mm -hmm. and we will have uh, the quantity demand is less than supply, right? So we have more good than we need, right? Then the price will drop. 
So this is very common, right? I think since last year, I mean, beginning of this year, right? And people are buying masks, but now the mask, the price is so low because now the, now the demand is so low there, right? So that's why the price will go down, right? Because if more, more people have a lot of inventory, right? So you have a, a lot of production there, but people don't want that many masks, so we go down, right? So that, that would be how you adjust, right? So that is uh, the seller, right? They have a lot of inventory, right? They want to sell it, they clear the inventory, so it go down. So that is how the adjustment go. Right? That's the story behind. Okay? So you can see no matter the price is above or below, okay? you go back to the center and it's pretty robust. Right? So that is why the market adjusts through the invisible hand. Right? There's no one actually telling you why the price got to go down. Right? It's because of people who want more or want less as a consumer would actually beat up the price. Right? Or the supplier wants to sell more product right? when they have too much inventory that drives down the price there. Right? So that is the uh, market adjustment there. Is that clear? So that is what we call invisible hand. Okay? So um, how invisible hand with the macro? So uh, probably you would say, okay, uh, it's market efficient. Uh, although we know the equilibrium, is it going to be anything good? So uh, one famous economist, uh, Mankiw, probably if you study undergraduate, then you will probably read his principal uh, textbook. Uh, or Mankiw is also the, uh, he's a economic advisor for uh, uh, the junior Bush in the 2000, uh, during 911 that time, right? He's an economic advisor, chair, I think he's, he's the chairman uh, for the uh, junior Bush. So what he said is uh, market is very powerful to allocate scarce resources, and you can look at why, right? Look at a lot of the scale of the history, okay? Look at last century, look at compare all the economy, who is doing capitalist decentralized one, who is more central, centralized planned economy, right? And you look at uh, a lot of economic growth uh, coming from uh, where is the, mar the market system is being used. And for those who do pan economy, it's also fail. So it's fairly consistent. Uh, where if you have uh, a lot of regulation, you don't allow market to react, it's fail. Right? Even you look at the US, right? the rent control doesn't work very well. So uh, that is the, uh, uh, the first thing. The second one is uh, how this market works. Uh, uh, according to Adam Smith, he said, uh, if you, everyone works actually promote the public interest, okay? Because everyone just buy according to what he needs, okay? Everyone try to produce according to look at the price, but in that case, they coordinate in the way that the uh, promoters also gain. So we will, quant we will quantify this statement, okay? Why market is doing the best for the society, okay? And um, is that when the market work, it allocate efficiently, okay? And so far, we didn't demonstrate why it allocate efficiently, okay? And why it said uh, it's good is produce at low cost, okay? So that is a very important part of market. And why economists favor market compared to others is because of the, uh, what we call the maximized social welfare, which you argue immediately now, okay? So it's a very important concept of why market work, okay? It's like this. How do you define how people uh, welfare or how people benefit from this uh, market, okay? Look at this graph, we call consumer surplus, is the rectangle, okay? So look at this downward sloping demand curve. Assuming this P is the market price, okay? The price is like this one, okay? And we argue that this triangle is a measure of how consumer well-being. Okay, uh, we don't want to provide foundation for that. There's a foundation, but uh, probably we see something in the next class. But there's a good measure of how well the people in this system. Arguably, remember this is how much they want to pay, right? 
and how much are they actually paying? Okay? So you look at a particular consumer here. Okay? This is how much they pay. This is how much they want to pay. The difference is the surplus is how much they get the good without paying that much, right? How happy they are. Right? And these represent all the guys adding up is how much happiness in total from joining the market. Right? Of course, this guy don't get anything happy because he just pay as he like the good, but all other people actually gaining. Right? So this triangle, the size of triangle, is measure how efficient the market is. Okay. So similarly, you can do the same analysis when you have supply curve. Okay. Oh, sorry. Supply curve is also like this, right? This is the price, this supply curve. Argue that this purple triangle is the uh, producer surplus, okay? Or uh, basically, you can say there's a profit, okay? And why there's profit? Because this is the, for the firm, this is the price they charge the consumer. And this is the cost they produce, right? The difference is the profit, right? And this profit, of course, shrinking, right? Uh, but this triangle is measure how good of uh, the producer or the seller, right? And how to evaluate the so-so, okay? Uh, okay? The so-so welfare, okay, is simply add up the two, okay? You may ask why I just add up, uh, why there's no more complicated function, uh, but this is tradition, so you can, uh, you can add, uh, do some other thing, but this is the standard way we do, okay? This uh, related to philosophy, why you can add up, but suppose we care. Um, oh, just one remark will be in the uh, European Union, okay? Uh, usually they will care about the total, okay? In the US, people only care about consumer surplus, okay? In terms of regulating industry. So you look at antitrust regulation, uh, we talk about whether the practice is illegal. Uh, in the US, they only focus on consumer. In the EU, they focus on the both. Okay? Whether the firm doing something, is it going to harm consumer? The only thing you care in the US. But in the EU, they will care about whether they may harm consumer, but also things can produce more efficiently, so on and so forth. Uh, that's why they would talk about those. Right, so that's why recently you can see uh, the iPhone, right? The lightning cable, right? And one of the reasons why they would ask is, one is uh, allow some compatibility, right? Reduce some cons producer's waste, right? Not just consumer, but producer also take into account. But anyway, uh, go back to here, sorry. Some uh, digression, but uh, look at the total surplus is the rectangle like this one, okay? So, we argue that this is the largest possible area you can achieve, okay? Why, okay? We argue that even though you're a planner, okay? Okay, even though you're a planner, you know everything, you can detect what is the price or quantity, you cannot be better than this one. Why? Look at the next slide, okay? Here is, consider the case where the government, the planner, detect this the price, okay? The government is very powerful, say, this is the price. You cannot sell different than this price. And in this case, of course, the, cons the consumer, only these people are going to buy, right? Unless, unless the uh, government say you have to buy this, okay? Uh, we assume the government is not going to be that powerful, okay? Only powerful in terms of design the price and quality, right? If the, if the government can do whatever, that is too powerful. Okay? Only powerful in the terms of dictating the terms of trade, okay? And this is the price they dictate, but that means that these consumers are not buying, right? So they are buying this price, right? Only this is the transaction, right, in the market. And of course, the firm is better off, the consumer is worse off, okay? But what we call this right triangle is called the dead weight loss, right? It's where something is lost because of regulation, right? If you don't follow the market, there's something less, right? If 
you think that consumer and buyer are similar, right? Then you shouldn't do this. Unless you think the firm is very important, okay? Or the corporation is very important, you have to favor them, okay? Otherwise, this cannot be more than, better than the previous one, right? And you will see if it's lower, if they take the price lower, consumer is very happy, right? And producer is not, right? And unless you think consumer is very important, you will do that, right? I mean, that also explains why you have rent control, right? Because rent control, actually, you maybe value this a lot, right? Especially uh, for poor people, they may have a lot of uh, thing right there. Then you will care, then maybe you impose uh, some rent control to justify why you don't want to maximize social surplus, right? Uh, because those people uh, actually want to buy a lot, maybe very poor. So that, that, that is the reason why uh, government want to intervene. But you can look at the case where the price is above equilibrium or below equilibrium is less than that, okay? So that means that market is efficient. That's what the invisible hand tell, right? Even though everyone is doing their own job, actually it's maximizing the social surplus. And one reason why people don't distinguish about producer and consumer is the producer profit is money. Actually, someone has to own the firm, so go back to the consumer anyway. So that is the reason why they don't distinguish the two, because although we call firm, right? Firm must be owned by somebody, right? So it's not going to the back hole, so some, somewhere someone get it. Okay, so that's the reason uh, why this is good. Okay? So, of course, uh, we say so many good things about market, it must be some problem with the market, or there might be, must be some thing that is not perfect. The first is, it's not fair, right? You need not be fair, you need not be equal, right? And because uh, later you will see, right? Because maybe people are not born equal, right? Some people inherit a lot of money from the parents or great grandparents that they don't need to work, right? And there's not, something is not fair. And also market can fail with externality, uh, market power in perfect information, which we will talk about this in the, uh, uh, in the part two of our class, okay? And especially when, people, when firms have market power, they need not follow that, right? They can charge, this is the price I got, I, I charge you. You don't have choice, right? Just like the power company, right? They charge, this is my electric bill. Pay or not pay, no choice, right? You only say the price goes up. Or the subway, the price is, you cannot say anything, right? That the price is that, that's it, right? Uh, you can't say anything. Uh, externality uh, also failed like the, uh, later you will see why it fails because externality simply means that uh, my, my, my production affects others. So, one recent case is in uh, Zhang Guanou. Uh, there is a cement factory try to produce, right? And the whatever the pollution goes to the other side, right? And uh, because what you do, right? Actually, you care about your stuff, right? But things may affect others, right? You don't take into account, and market can't easily solve those problems, okay? Or what we know the uh, recently with a lot of uh, uh, carbon trading or green bond, right? These are the things that actually uh, you produce more uh, environmental friendly stuff, actually is uh, carry some benefit to others, right? But if market cannot trade those things, so there's uh, some issue there. So in that case, government should uh, intervene, right? Or, or may not, but, uh, or the corporate should intervene, right? Or non-profit should be there. So we will talk about those there, but at least market is efficient. In that sense, if in the ideal world, but in, in certain case, uh, say suppose in perfect information, uh, then things would doesn't uh, work as well, and that will be uh, happen in the finance. Right? In the finance, a lot of market power, right? A lot of big uh, investor, institutional one, right? 
they can easily move the market, right? And uh, also there's some externality there, right? Because how you trade actually reveal some of your information there, right? Maybe you know the firm is good, you spend your resources to do research, and what you buy actually reveal, right? Say when Warren Buffett in the market, well, probably you know this firm is going to be good, right? So Warren Buffett cannot capture all his uh, uh, cost to invest to study the stock, right? So people, other people capture it, right? So he has to hide it, right? Try not to tell you he's buying, right? But by high end seed, right? You lose some of efficiency there. Uh, so that would be the case. Okay. And uh, as we said, right, because of the market is there, we allow some specialization or different labor, right? And that is uh, with market, so everyone can do the trade easily, right? And then, and then you have exchange, and then I focus on what I do, right? And that's why you study master of uh, finance, right? Because you focus on one thing that is specialized, you become an expert of finance, and then you can make more money, right? And uh, because of keep doing this, right, you will have a uh, from a scale, right? You can have uh, uh, learning by doing, right? Economic scale is the concept. If those who don't learn economics, economic scale is because of uh, you do things in a big scale, right? Then you getting the cost is much lower. Just like what happened in Tesla. Right? Tesla is like they have large scale production, so the cost brings so low compared to other other new uh, car manufacturer where scale production is very low, right? Uh, because of high fixed cost, right? So you have you have large production, the the average cost is much lower. So uh, that's what specialization is doing, right? And we have famous economist, David Ricardo. Some of you know, may not know, but they introduced the concept of comparative advantage, right? It's saying that why a uh, country would trade is because of uh, a different country, a different situation, right? If the f country are the same, there's no to trade, right? We trade between country, it's because of uh, different place of different, what we call comparative advantage, right? Is the cost of doing this is lower relative to the others. They focus on this one, okay? And uh, that actually explains a lot of the basis of trade theory, right? And uh, in one of the case we call the trade war, see? Then you will probably touch on some of those, but we will not uh, go into detail because time, so um, probably you would wonder how does uh, all this econ thing relate to finance, right? We'll talk about the next class, sorry, next section. Okay. After the break, will be financial market is actually, uh, can be efficient to allocate with financial resources, right? And of course, uh, there are a lot of market failure Right, when information is symmetric, there's an issue there. Right, probably fun thing that you would think is in the uh, Hong Kong stock market, right? There's a main board, right, where most things are trade, but also there's a call the GEM, right? And basically, there's no trade, right? And you may ask why, right? It's because of mainly, I would argue, is due to information asymmetry. Right, because it's owned by small number of people, it's opaque, you don't want to be trade there. Right? Because some people have largely market power there. If you go there, you bring scoop. Right? So that's why the financial market only be good if the nice thing are satisfied. If not, that's not going to work. Right? If the market is not free, it's not have not have economic scale, doesn't work anyway. So probably you can say now uh, our central government have a new policy to have a new trade zone in Shanghai. So you can predict what will happen. Is it going to be price is going to free? Is scale is big enough? You can tell. Okay. And uh, there's a also comparative advantage and specialization of division of labor that give us there are many different types of financial institutes. 
which I will go over quickly. But that explains why uh, different uh, institutes have different role. Okay, some of them solve information asymmetry. Some of them solve uh, adverse selection along many, many, many problems. Externality, all this kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, but I uh, want to say, right, is everything what we learn is really, we can't really apply to finance, right? Uh, so. so I guess uh, we can talk this uh, after the break. And I guess in the break time, it would be good uh, to get uh, some of your feedback. Okay, we'll break of 15 minutes, but during break, you can fill in that one. You can tell me how well you're feeling, how fast I'm doing, how difficult I am. So to gauge your uh, uh, feedback, because uh, you, no one asks questions. So we don't know how, well, how fast or how slow I'm doing. So we can have a break. We'll come back at uh, uh, 4.30.
Um, so, uh, so I guess I should, uh, resume. Uh, so, uh, most of you feel okay. Uh, some of you not so great. Uh, at least no one feel terrible after five hours of, uh, classes, right? I think most of you have, uh, class in the morning and the afternoon, so at least you feel okay. And uh, so I guess the, the mean is three, so overall the speed is okay, but uh, some of you said uh, during the break, I asked, uh, some of you said a little bit, maybe slow for those who know, maybe too fast for those who don't know. Uh, that means it's good, right? Because it's hard to, hard to cater for everyone, so it means that that's all right. Um, so uh, overall, it's okay to follow. Uh, so some of you actually told me that, I mean, many of you are working right during the day, so during the weekday, then uh, uh, worry about the difficulty level of this class. And uh, I would say except the first two classes, which the second class is built on the first class, or it gives the foundation for that. Otherwise, other classes are more or less independent. So if, even if you don't fully follow the one class, you should not have issue for the other one. So, uh, but uh, that being said, if you have any question, though, so pay, please uh, email the tutor, TA, or me, and then see what we can do for that. Uh, but uh, the thing we cover is very fairly standard. So it's not something very specialized. So whatever textbook, whatever thing you can find, can figure that out, okay? And uh, number four, yes, demand supply, yeah, that we lost. Yes, so surplus maximize at the market equilibrium, equilibrium is hand. Oh, this is good. So we copy where something we're happy, the key point. Yes, uh, that is exactly what we will do in the next class. How to derive the demand curve is based on consumer maximize happiness or utility. So that is the foundation. People sit for happiness is the foundation of demand curve. So that actually are ahead of us. So exactly correct. Uh, yes. Uh, so economics is about allocation of resources. Yeah, that, is the, that is the classical way of doing. Uh, 
supply and demand. Exam will be easy for part time. Oh, I didn't say it would be easy, but I would say you will be easy if you pay attention to the class. So, I mean, if you don't do anything, don't attend the class, don't expect you will, you will pass, right? You don't, you, you don't do the homework, you don't take the exam, right? You will fail. But I, I only say if you attend the class, do the homework, it's difficult to fail. That's why I said, okay? I didn't say you don't do anything, you will pass, okay? It's very different. Um, how can I use it in the banking industry? So, of course, depend on uh, what do you mean by banking industry because there are many things, right? Uh, and uh, later, one thing we talk about is credit rationing. Uh, these are the things that actually describe the banking industry. Uh, and uh, why we are credit agency is basically uh, to, to solve some information asymmetry problem. And uh, unfortunately, I I don't think we have any particular for banking industry because of the fact that we only a, a class for econ for finance practice. So uh, for money and banking, that will be it will be another class. But I but what we trying to say is our model actually or the knowledge we learn will be applied, right? And and that's I think that's what what I can say. Um, and why you have the deposit say insurance system, those kind of things can also explain through our model. Uh, but I'm not sure in particular what do you mean by how can I use, but uh, probably need to be more, more specific, okay? Because uh, not sure what problem you're thinking about. Well, um, at least uh, you can use it with your, your certificate or master, you can get a higher salary. So I think that is the, I think that's a thing. Uh, number six. So, so far better than last semester lecturer. Uh, so, so, so if that jokes, mm, so, so I suppose it's joke. Uh, I try to be better, but uh, that's a good one. So break is healthy. Uh, yeah, I think break is good, 50 minutes, I think it's a good one. Uh, hard to tell if you understand or not. Uh, then there will be the, I think the tutorial probably would help you to, to see if you understand or not. Uh, or uh, that would, hopefully that would be helpful. Um, so far okay. So better slow down, okay, I will try to slow down. Uh, if, but you have to tell me because I'm not sure uh, I'm too fast or too slow. So if you question, just please ask. Because uh, I don't need to rush, right? We don't need to rush because it's more important to cover things you know rather than I just rush over. Uh, but because of I said, I mean, some people think I'm too slow, some people too fast. So uh, it's because they always trade off, right? I go too slow, then uh, maybe it doesn't worth the, your tuition. Uh, but in case you need me to explain in more detail, I try to, okay? Uh, well. Yeah, I just talked about Maisie, yeah. But anyway, so, um, okay. Just, if you have any questions, just please feel free to, uh, uh, you can use the WeChat, right, to leave question there. We try to cover that in the next class or in the tutorial. So we, I think, I think, I think the WeChat will be very good because uh, some of you can discuss through the reach out if there's a question there. I guess that would be very useful for the use of, use of reach out, right? I mean, as the uh, Kelvin said, right, said, use for the class. So I think discussion of the things that you don't know can also be reasonable use of that. Okay. So um, as we said, a finance, right, is the studying the allocation of financial assets through the financial market, and that, that's basically of that, right? So that's studying the finance is no different from econ. Right? Or for the banking industry, the same. 
right? That would be not nothing different. But the only difference is uh, uh, different types of the financial assets, right? The bonds, stocks, and foreign currency, right? Depending on each type of assets, they will be somewhat different, right? Because you can imagine the case of demand and supply will also apply. But what affects demand and supply will be slightly different according to different market, right? Whether the future is important, uncertainty is the key, and so on and so forth, right? For example, derivative, right? Which depends on underlying assets, right? And so on and so forth, right? These are things are all the time, dimension will be important, right? But underlying force is still demand and supply. And there are many prices in the financial market, right? Like the interest rate, exchange rate, and stock price, and bond price. And probably you ask, okay, uh, what complication is there? The main problem or the main difficulties of looking at the financial market is because of they're so interrelated. And especially related to the macro, right? Look at the interest rate, right? It's not just because of the fact that the banks have the interest rate and that's it, or how the uh, deposit there and the people want to borrow determine the price, right? It also depends on how the Look at Hong Kong, right? Look at the uh, look at how people money comes in and goes out, and there's so many things. The central bank, there's so many players there. So that makes finance very complicated to analysis compared to the price in the supermarket, right? Because it's different market related, and also the law uncertainty would matters a lot, right? And also the present, the future, right? The time dimension, uncertain dimension, and the relationship between market that makes everything very complicated. Okay, but of course. Every, everything would be logic the same, right? Still demand supply. Okay, no matter how difficult you're looking at, still the same thing would determine the outcome. And of course, what's quantity in this model, right? You look at this turnover, you don't have stock, right? Or how much long your transaction is there, right? And, and again, as we said, there are a lot of the players, right? There's not, not just the stock market, right? Not just investor, right? Buyer and seller there, right? There are a lot many people, right? Look, the bank, we have a lot of uh, investment company with accounting firm, there's so many things, right? So that to analyze the stock market means that you have to analyze the whole thing to understand what's going on, right? So that's why it's very difficult, right? So that's why we need to study, right? And we only can study part by part, each by each, right? You, you, at the end, we aggregate everything into the macro economy, right? So that's why we progress one by one. and. The trade-off, as we said, right, there's a, at least two dimension trade-off compared to standard model, right? Standard good, you don't really care about risk and return, right? How much is the risk I buy a drink here, right? I just buy a tea there. How much risk I'm going to do? There's nothing, right? Just unless there's some poison, right? Otherwise, not going to risk anything, right? But when you buy a stock or exchange trade or are you going to buy bond, right? That would be risk, right? Because it involves some future dimension, right? That's also the other one. So that makes everything very complicated. But at the end of the day, same thing. Okay. So here is a lot of uh, uh, financial market, right? I think it's okay. I don't go one by one, right? Uh, just say very standard. Uh, uh, these are the place where you trade different stuff, right? You should ask yourself. What are the demand supply? Okay, ask yourself, who is the, the stock market? Do we have consumer? Do we have firm? Do we have that? What are the, what are the what, who, who is the demand supply? How the stock price is being determined? Anyone want to say something? Because I think it's now, yeah, please. Okay, so uh, the firm. So, look for consider this case. Look at the stock trade in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange or any exchange you can consider. Is it firm involved in the trading? Sorry, is it firm involved in any trading of the stock in this stock market? So, so who is buying the stock? Who is selling the stock? Yeah, individual, right? So individual are involved, right? The individual who want to buy with the with the demand, right? Who do to sell will be the 
not the firm, but just some investor, right? Because you and me can be the buyer or seller, right? The deal, there's a, the complication is that the dual role of the buyer and seller, right? In, at some point of time, you can be the buyer. At some point, you can sell it, right? The, the, the role of buyer and seller depends on property and price, right? It's kind of endogenous. So it's not that easy to anal an analysis, right? Because of the fact that, I mean, buyer and seller is slightly little bit more complicated. Supply is the one who want to have the stock, want to sell. It's you so, not the outstanding share? Uh, well, it's this, well, okay. Outstanding share is the thing that available to buy or sell. The Q, you can look at, okay, this is this question. You look at the graph here. So what you will see is this, uh, you look at the stock market, right? There's a, uh, now you say electronic one, the limit order book there, right? You have buy side and speed and ask. Right? And these are the people who want to buy. Right? This is the price you want to sell. And transact over there. Right? So in, in the modern stock market, they sell as a what we call the double auction. So basically, the people who just want to name the price they want to buy and people they want to sell. Right? And this, uh, the electronic platform, they just match both sides. Right? Is this then the, this is the demand will be the people who want to buy the stock. This is the people who want to sell the stock. And this is the market price. This is the quantity transact. Okay. And in the in the, the stock market, there's no firm there, right? And people can can switch around depends on the condition. But in general, that 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 is how you apply, right? So you would you would think, right? If people are being confident, okay, what you would be we would do compare statics here, right? Suppose people think. Uh, now our central government think uh, Hong Kong would be good, right? Get get more confident about the future, right? What happened is this demand curve, how it looks like, will be shifting to the uh, right hand side. So that's what the compare statics, right? So if you think, okay, now people are getting more confident, right? The the demand will shift up. What does that mean? Is it for the same price, more people want it. So the shift to the right-hand side. And then this will be the new equilibrium. Okay. And you can see from this simple example, people are about the confident about the future, how they expect the future can change the price. Right? Because they think the future is there, going up, right? Then we adjust. Right? But the problem, interesting problem would be if people expect the price is going up. Right? And that will be immediately reflected into the price. Right? Because you expect tomorrow things happen is good, right? Then people will be smart to trade at a higher price right now. Right? But of course, later we'll talk about how fast it is it's called we call the efficient market hypothesis. But uh but here is uh what it means. Is that okay? Is that okay? So that would be the that would be the price, right? So you can usually see uh, how the supply and demand looks like, right? If the, consider the case, as we said, outstanding share is important, is suppose um, the firm issue new shares. What would happen to this? How can we analyze it, this model? Or suppose, a bit easier, suppose the major, major shareholder try to try to sell his shares, right, which previously hold in his own pocket. Okay. What happened? How to analyze this model? Anyone try to do? Yeah, supply will increase, then the price will drop, and more quantity trade, right? So that would, be, that would be the thing, right? Suppose someone who tried to dump the stuff, right, down there, then means for whatever prices, right, they have higher quantity, right, that will be intercept here. So that is how you will be able to uh, use this diagram to explain, right? And uh, probably everyone knows it, right? But uh, that is the framework that can try to explain. Uh, you can easily explain in what dimension you will see, right? Because of course, everyone would expect uh, we can see the price movement, but this would also tell you the quantity movement, right? Because easy to see, right? More stuff being sold, the price will lower, right? 
But here, the model also tells tell you uh, the quantity. Right? And what does that mean? It means that there's a very important dimension we often omitted when you look at the stock market, is the quantity. Right? We often look at the price, how the price movement and predict the future, right? But if you don't look at the quantity, there's a, a lot of myths, right? Many of you are experts, much better than I do in terms of actual trading, right? And quantity is a very important thing, right? And we often said, right, when the price goes up without quantity movement, actually it's the raising without support, right? So quantity is a important thing. Look at the demand, right? Go back to the previous slide, sorry, previous exercise, right? We talk about if, if, the, if the price, right, raised with the quantity, it shows that actually, actually the real demand goes up, right? So that's why this, this explains our common knowledge of custom conventional wisdom, right? Price goes up. If associated with the quantity increase, it's a solid demand shift, right? Not due to some other, other factor, right? So I hope, I mean, even that's a very simple diagram, I mean, you can tell a lot of story, right? Without, without going into a lot of uh, complicated analysis, right? So this diagram, right, as I said, is very useful, right? although I didn't, we didn't have time to tell you uh, in detail how to apply, right? Look at the bond market, or everything can be done in a similar way, right? And uh, of course, uh, the question is, in the real world, a lot of time the demand supply shift at the same time, right? And you have to make the call which one is more uh, important, right? Again, you can tell, because in the real world, it's not like the class, right? Something changed, but in the real world, there's many news, many things comes in, right? And what, how can you predict the future price? Depend on how you think, which factor dominate over the others, right? And of course, uh, how to do it is based on quantitative model, right? In the, in, the, in the world that you would try to fit in the model and you do some prediction, right? That's how I think many of you would see those models in the practice. Right. Any question? Yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, this one, huh? Oh. So you can ima imagine why horizontal is. What's demand curve is at this price? How many how many people would want want to buy? So I shift to the right means at this price, how many people want to buy? So it's a this is a demand is based on function. But this is price, right? It's function of price. So you give me the price, I give you how much I want to buy, market want to buy. Oh yeah, that that's a like you can imagine. We will talk about this in next class. But in general, say the manufacturer can affect one of them is confidence or the future, right? So, so suppose you expect the market. I mean, this is static, but you can imagine people would think if the economy is doing well in the future, right? The company is going to generate more profit. That gives me more dividend, and that means that the the value of the today's stock is more valuable, right? Then at the same price of the stock, you would want more. So that, that's why you shift to the right. Is that clear how it, the logic? Oh, supply is, as I said, is in, in the stock market case, is before the, maybe the majority shareholder, he keep the stock in his, under the bed, okay? For some reason, right? Don't, don't trade, right? And now he just go out and just, okay, I want to dump everything on the market. Then so for every price, it's just more supply there, right? Or they issue the new shares or whatever, there are many, many reasons why it increase, right? Oh, it's, not, it's never linear. We don't even know what the shape is. can be any different shape, but linear, it's just a graphical representation of that. And of course, for everyone who do regression, you can run linear regression, that will be that, but it need not be linear. In general, it's not linear, of course. Linear is a very special case. But linear actually tells you many ideas already. Okay? In general, it's not linear, of course. Because you can see this is, this is the 
line, but in general, it's a more that discrete style stuff. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You go you use regression to estimate this kind of stuff. Uh, okay. So okay, you're quite, you're you're asking a very complicated question. So you're asking the regression to explain this and what's R square. Um, so in general, when you okay. Uh, the problem is when you once, okay, okay, the question, or may, I may rephrase the question. The question is, uh, how can I estimate that in the real world and how good is the model is? Uh, in the finance model, usually we don't have this demand supply, right? The only thing usually we got is, we, sometimes we have, because we have the limit order book, we can do that. But uh, most of the time you only see the price and quantity, right? So in, in terms of statistics, what we try to do is to explain how the price arrives, how you explain this price, okay? And uh, even explaining the price of a certain stock is very difficult. We are only able, usually we can only explain why this is more expensive than the other one. We can explain the relative price. So the cap model, that's what they give you. And uh, if you explain a single price, we will give you some, Next class, we talk about some pricing equation. Give you why this price comes out. Uh, but in general, it's, it's very hard. Yeah. yeah, it's very hard. It's a very hard question. Uh, to If you do uh, econometrics on there. Yeah. But when we talk about, if you thought, explain the price, usual R square is very large because time series data. So, so if you look at the finance class, you suppose you use the uh, three factor model, the R square is like 80%. It's very, it's very high because time series model. So, uh, but anyway, uh, that's not. So I just want to illustrate example that uh, all this market you can use demand supply to anal analyze. Okay, even the foreign exchange market and all the things. But as I said, uh, because these are with the whole economy, you can, you if you do want to do analysis can be a little bit more complicated. Right? If you do formally, right, you have to write out the mathematical model and try to make some assumption and solve it. Okay, but uh, but they are the ideas very same, right? So I hope that I convince you that what we learn is very useful. Um, all this thing is there. There's a some derivative money and capital in the bank. I'm not going to one by one because I guess this is something that since you're a master student you should know this, right? It's just a description, so I'm not going to uh, go into detail of those. So this other other market, so I just basically skip it because there's this some description there. Okay, I'm not going into detail, but you can ask yourself, okay, how should you apply this there? Who are the what's the price there? What's the quantity there? Who are the demand side? Who is the supply side? Right? How things change in the market and adjustment, right? And how look at the quantity adjustment and can you tell, right? Because in the real world, we don't observe the demand supply. We don't observe the quantity and price changes. And by looking at this, you can go back to ask, is it demand shift or supply shift? And then you can see that will guide your investment decision, right? As I said, right? If the price associated with quantity, right? Then you expect this is going to be, right? A demand shift, right? Probably you want to buy, right? If the, if the other way around, right? Maybe just supply shift, right? Because uh, if the price doesn't go up with that thing, with the quantity, right? So you can imagine that the other way one to think is like this, right? Supply shift to the left, right? Also, you have the new equilibrium here, right? Where the price goes up, but the quantity drops, right? Then you can tell whether they actually supply because in the real world, we don't really observe those, right? But looking at the changes, right? That's why the Number of transaction, the quantity is very important, right? So that that is the reason why just don't look at the don't simply look at the price. Price itself is something, but it's not inform. Is it can be more informative if you look at quantity as well. Okay, is there anything I can say more? But let's just stop here to answer any question that you might have. Okay, but I guess everyone would know this knowledge already. But I just formalize it in in demand supply model. Right, you can see it's not, uh, although it's very simple, but uh, it's not something that uh, 
you can derive without looking at the model. Right? The model actually has some, something to say. Okay. And uh, one important aspect of financial market is what we call price discovery. Okay. And the reason is because for the stock, we don't know the price. Right? I mean, the stock market, we know the price very clearly every time. Right? There's a the thing that uh, when things are, when the company first go public, right? And they don't know what to sell, right? That's why they rely on auction, right? The IPO is always almost like the auction, right? And after that, they would put in the market, right? But uh, that is a very important function of that. And as we argue, market actually uh, give an efficient allocation of resources, right? By maximizing the producer surplus and consumer surplus. That's why uh, stock market is very important. Right? Can you imagine that is the reason why uh, the stock market, the GEM market, right? that is not very good in allocating ownership because the market is not very efficient. Right? There's not much trade there. Right? So there's a lot of efficiency goes on. Okay, and there's uh, some other role. I think it's not very. I mean, probably you would know it, right? It's just like if you I me mean, a lot of investment opportunity, and and one of the important is very important is liquidity. liquidity. Uh, one thing that distinguishes the financial market to other market is what we call liquidity or immediacy, which where you can buy or sell right away, compared to housing market where you can spend some time to sell, right? So that is very important and liquidity. Uh, we'll talk about that in detail in the uh, six or seven class is uh, liquidity is uh, uh, what we sometimes is considered as uh, uh, how liquid the market, right? Depends on how uh, information asymmetry of the market. So later you will see, uh, looking at the bid ask spread, it will be helpful uh, for us to see uh, what happened in the market. Okay, but we we left it to when the when we talk about that in the six or seven class, and also there's a hedging or risk transfer, okay, because of uh you have diverse ownership, um, okay, and um, there's a way you can do uh offer analysis and diversification, but uh, I think all these are pretty much straightforward. I'm not going to talk about those, okay. and uh. One thing I want to mention a little bit more is about the institution, financial institution and market efficiency, right? And probably you ask if market is so good, right? Why we have so many market institutions, right? We need the investment bank, why we need banks, why we need accounting firm, why we need credit agency, we need so many stuff. It's because market by itself is not perfect enough. There's a lot of issues with the market. Uh, so that's why uh, you do master finance. Right? Otherwise, we just have the stock market there, then everyone will be trading and done. Right? Why we need some analysts, right? that's the reason. And uh, say, if you look at what bank is, right? bank is basically channeling the uh, depositor and creditor, right? the lender and borrower. Right? It's the matching both sides of the market, which we'll talk about the platform in the seventh class. Right, but basically speaking, right, is they can't really match very well, well, right? And in the case study, you would talk about a high, the fintech, Dian Yong, uh, they will talk about how the P2P are matching, okay? But uh, this is the role, because why you need this role? Because of information asymmetry, right? Because you don't really know who is good, who is bad, right? You need the, you need the bank who is specialized and look at who is borrowing, Right, look at whether it's worth borrowing, it's worth lending the money. So that's why the bank, right? So bank arise because of information asymmetry, right? Otherwise, we can appear to peer, right? That's what the Dianong is doing. But Dianong still do the underwriting anyway, right? And insurance company, uh, you will ask why we have that. It's because of uh, risk sharing. And later, probably next, next week, we'll talk about, most, in general, most people are risk averse. Right? We don't want to take risks. Right? Some of you may enjoy going to Macau Casino with, uh, with laughing, but in general, most of us are risk averse. Right? We don't want to take risks. And 
insurance company basically trying to diversify the risk, right? So that's why we talk about this information asymmetry and contract theory there. And investment firm, uh, why we do that is because uh, in general, right, some of the people who are not, it's a specialization, right? People are not, do not know look, how to look at the portfolio, especially big investment, right? Or an investment bank basically would help the firm to go public. Why you need to do that? Why the firm does not go public by himself? It's because not everyone trusts the new company, right? Investment bank tend to be in, in there for many years. By putting his name on the, as an underwriter, he tried to certify that the company is good, right? So basically, this is trying to solve information asymmetry, right? So as you, as you can see, every single bank is trying to solve the problem that the market cannot solve, right? Otherwise, we only have one financial market and solve all the problem, okay? So that's because of market is imperfect, although market is good, but that's imperfect, that's give a lot of role in finance, right? Same as mutual fund, right? People don't know how to invest, right? It's, we have so many things to invest, so that's why in mutual fund exists, right? And pension fund, the same idea, right? And why probably you ask why pension fund, right? It's because of uh, we want to save for the future, right? And uh, by economy scale, you compile the money together and invest, right? Because this is basically the scale of economy. If you combine the money together, you invest, it's cheaper than you invest by yourself, right? So although MPF is losing a lot of money, right? But uh, maybe or maybe not that better than we invest ourselves. I don't know, I mean, I don't have any judgment on that. I mean, but you can, you can tell, right? Hedge fund, uh, why it exists, what it's used is because of hedge fund is, of course, hedge risk, but other is due to the fact that uh, is it help the market to go to equilibrium, right? In the financial market, uh, a lot of time, equilibrium price will be arrived, but the problem is uh, sometimes you take a huge transaction cost to do it, right? But hedge fund usually they have much lower transaction cost, so they more or less can close this uh, price difference we call arbitrage, right? To close it, to close that. So that is uh, because a different market, right? Different people cannot easily see the connection between the market. But hedge fund can exploit the difference. And by the buying or selling, right? They are part of the invisible hand. Right? So that's why you can see uh, market imperfection to give us a, a lot of job opportunity, right? If the market is being perfect, then we lose all the jobs. So probably some of you may worry with AI, will we lose jobs? Uh, the answer is possibly yes. Right, as probably some of you may notice, right? Um, I think last, last year, two years ago, right? The Goldman Sachs in the New York City, uh, they fired the whole trading department uh, and because they no, don't, no longer need any trader, uh, they replaced it by 20 engineers who, who do the trading, right? So in the future, I mean, obviously there's a lot of thing that uh, will be replaced by computer because computer do better than human, right? And some of the job will be gone, uh, but uh, how long will your master of finance value? I don't know. I mean, it's a too big question, but at the end of the day, I mean, you will depreciate, but the problem is if they depreciate before we retire, that doesn't really matter anyway, right? So probably you, don't, you shouldn't advise your kid to do master of finance. It's okay for you to do master of finance, but not for your kid, right? Um, and uh, there's some venture capital, uh, private equity and credit agency, but you can see they all of less uh, try to solve some information asymmetry problem, right? Because venture capital, no one want to invest in startup because you don't know, right? So that's a, that's a reason why they want equity rather than debt, right? So if you don't perform, they will increase the equity, right? So, so that's so on and so forth, right? I'm not going to go to detail because I want to save the time to talk about other things, but you can see all these things basically coming from problem of the market, okay? Uh, so I want to, uh, you pay attention to this uh, efficient market hypothesis, okay? Uh, so this is a uh, hypothesis that put forward by one very famous uh, financial economist, Eugene Farmer. I think he got the Nobel Prize, uh, I don't know, I forgot the year, but recent 10 years. Um, and he, he tried to think that, I mean, the financial market, they're very efficient. 
okay? And it is impossible, okay, to make return that constantly beat the market, okay? And probably you don't believe that because you are in master finance, right? You, you think that I'm some mark, then uh, I should be able to beat the market. But turn out, I mean, you look at the data that doesn't seem to be except some very good trader like Warren Buffet or other people, but most people actually lose money. Look at the MPF, right? Most, the MPF is that most people lose money anyway. Um, so in academic, uh, uh, if it's a market hypothesis, usually it's separate in the free part. Uh, one of them, width form. Width form is the stock price now reflect everything in the past. Okay? So you don't need to look at, that means that if you are the chartist, you are the guy who look at the past history, look, you are looking at the uh, technical analysis, it's not going to work. If you believe this is true. The other one is semi-strong form, which essentially said in, in additional to the past, also include the current one, okay? So any news is immediately reflected there, okay? The other one is the strongest one is not just the public, also the private one, okay? And probably you ask, uh, which of the following would be true? Um, uh, I think in general, uh, at least the width form would hold in general, uh, because uh, look at the empirical data, uh, you will see that uh, it's very difficult to predict the stock price. Later we will, we will see why, okay? And what evidence, okay? The first is a lot of market anomaly actually will quickly correct. Okay, a lot of price difference uh, quickly will, will go correct. Um, another is like, uh, it's very difficult to beat the market. So you can't find a fund that consistently beat the market, uh, except some of them, but you look at the data, uh, yeah. most of them are survival bias. Okay? Only the fund that actually performed will survive. But you look at the thing that actually started in the beginning, most of them are actually cannot be the market. So if you think that you can't be the market, you can as well buy the passive investment, right? Just by the index there. And, uh, and it's very difficult to identify, right? Undervalue, overvalue stock based on public information, right? Uh, because, the, because of the thing is too many smart people. So you have to beat the smart people to get money, right? So, that's the thing. And the third one, the stock price react rapidly to news announcement. And uh, how fast is it? Uh, look at the time, there's an empirical study that when the, the time that without Twitter, okay, at a time where you, people depend on Bloomberg terminal, right? And you ask how fast the news is incorporated in the stock price, uh, the standard is like four hours. So something that put in the Bloomberg terminal, there's something new, good news for that company, then four hours, then the price go to the equilibrium on average four hours. And then you ask, okay, now the Twitter okay, or other social media, how fast is the market now? The average time now is 15 minutes. So if you see the thing comes in 15 minutes, the market adjusts quickly, okay? So very fast, right? Of course, you can still make money even fast enough, right? But still, I mean, it's a, it's a very big competition over there, okay? And as we see, there's a limited success of constant generating and more profit, right? And you can see the tech trader is not going to work very well. Okay, of course, uh, this is general, right? It, there may be some very smart people that can still make money, but in general, it's very hard. Okay, that's the evidence there. And what does that mean? It means that if this is true, which is, I think is, Many of them are true. Uh, you would suggest that we, whether we should do active and passive, right? And actively beating the market usually doesn't work. If you look at the empirical result, they will tell you that individual investor actually lose money because they trade too much. Actually, if you don't trade a lot of time, actually you don't lose that much, actually you make some gain. By passive investment, actually sometimes it's better. Of course, I talk about average, right? If you're smart, then that's no problem, right? You can identify something, you can make money, you can make money, but in general, it's like this, okay? And if it's a market, as I already said, right? In general, the price in financial market 
is pretty much fair, okay? Uh, it's very difficult to find undervalued and overvalued assets. Not that easy. And uh, it means that the market is information efficient. It's where we respond, as I already said, the Twitter case, 15 minutes. And a lot of market anomaly, right? If you look at anomaly like the, what we call the, I said, the weekend effect, right? Monday tend to be lower, or January effect, right? January tend to be lower, and many other anomaly there, actually very quickly it's go away, right? And because of people know anomaly, if people know there's something special, can exploit, there's so, so many hedge funds doing that, right? So it's very difficult to beat the market, right? If there's something can be made money, then someone will come in, okay? And there's some early tests of the uh, uh, efficient market hypothesis. One of them is called the uh, random walk. It's saying that the extreme example is, if I look at the math, it's saying that the future price was the best predictor, is the past price. Okay? It's saying that the stock market, the stock price, is like a random walk. What's random walk? Imagine that I drink a lot of beer, okay? I get drunk, okay? And then my, the price is going to be left or right, up or down, right? You go this way, it's up, you look down, right? It's just like I close my eye, I just walk, okay? This is the best way to model the stock price, okay? And turn out that it's true. I mean, you can't really beat it, okay? Turn out that there's an empirical study that try to see if you use a lot of time series model, AMA model or whatever, advanced model, actually time series model, the white noise actually beats, okay? Really can't predict. Um, and there are a lot of criticisms to uh, EMH, uh, like the behavioral finance, uh, what say people have a lot of biases, right? So it's somewhat like what we call the, something we call hot, some of uh, uh, biases like hot hand theory, right? You go to casino, right? You try to buy something, you win, and then you win again, you win again, you think you are very good luck, right? You keep buying. And you can pick your amount, then you lose a lot, and you go out. But, but that is, uh, you would try to have a com com confirmation bias, right? You just confirm something is wrong. You think you have, maybe you got a very good information source from someone, right? Or you are very smart, right? But by winning sometimes, then you think it's wrong. And it keeps like this, right? And you can see a lot of bubbles goes on uh, in the world, like the Bitcoin, right? I would say bubble. Right, a lot of bubble in the world uh, that seems to say contradict EMH, okay? But in general, EMH holds, but there's some, still there's some anomaly there. We will talk about something bubble in the uh, next week. So um, what is the criticism, right? And I will end very soon, so don't worry. I'm not over time. Uh, so the criticisms of uh, the EMH is, uh, it is costly to get information. Right, because if you want to know how the stock is, right, and you have to spend resources and effort on that. So there's a classical problem is if it's costly to, have, to get information and people can feel right, right, because the, I, we have people who can see the price, okay? So this is an economic result. There's a theory result saying that as long as getting information is costly, the market will never be perfect. Almost perfect, but never perfect. So that is what we understand in the real stock market is because of information is costly. So that's why the market will be almost efficient, but not that there, okay? And of course, information asymmetry also make the market deviate because there's some, a lot of insider trading goes on, okay? And in some people would do technical analysis and chart pattern, algo trading or AI trading actually can make some money, okay? So. Uh, that's why there's some challenge with EMH as well. So let me conclude quickly. So what we study today is the, the market, right? The main thing you remember is this, demand supply, and demand supply are, are, apply to many market, and actually itself tells you a lot of stuff. Of course, the next class will give you foundation of why, how this form, right? Because under, understand how they form, how this light comes in, how this come in, then you can do a lot of analysis, right? Because tell you this, how it shift, how it move, you don't know, right? You have to give the foundation. This will be the next class. And uh, 
in the finance, uh, you can see uh, the market, we have argued, is close to efficient, right? That means that if close to efficient, that means that we're able to explain the financial outcome market from economics, right? If the market is not efficient, if the market is out of equilibrium, there's no way to analyze, right? So that means that it justifies what we're doing the next, okay? So I think I should end now. I will see you next week. I think the computer uh, is going to say something. I'm okay. I'm okay. I just need to.